Welcome to today's library seminar titled Estimating Catch Misreporting in a State-Space Doc Assessment Model. I'm Lisa Clark, one of the reference librarians at the NOAA Central Library. This presentation is part of the series National Stock Assessment Science Seminars, which is put out by NOAA Fisheries National Stock Assessment Program. Kristen Blackheart from NOAA Fisheries will introduce our speaker, Dr. Charles Peretti. But before that, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy your presentation today. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This resolves most technical issues. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel, as well as the Library Seminars website by tomorrow morning. We will also be accepting questions throughout the webinar, which, which um, Charles will address at the end of his presentation. Please feel free to type your questions in the question box on the right side of your screen at any time. So with that, I thank you for attending this Library Center and turn the presentation over to Kristen. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, we are very excited to have Dr. Charles Peretti from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center with us today. He will be talking about a very current and kind of high profile issue, uh, catch misreporting. Mis uh, it's uh, an issue that affects all regions, but especially the Northeast. So with that, I won't take any more time from Charles and I will hand it over. Okay, uh, thank you. Kristen and Lisa. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to give a talk. Um, I'll start out just with a little bit of, about myself and my two co-authors. Um, all three of us are stock assessment scientists at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole. Uh, I'm the lead biologist for Gulf of Maine haddock and cod, and uh, my research interests include uh, forecasting methods, state space assessment models, uh, and model validation techniques in general. The other co-author uh, is John Darola. He's the lead for Atlantic herring and monkfish assessments. Uh, he has expertise in management strategy evaluation uh, and simulation testing, uh, both of which were important for this project. And, and then Chris Legault, he's the lead for Georgia's Bank Yellowtail. Uh, he does lots of stock assessment methods things at the center, uh, and he has longtime interest in retrospective patterns. So the work I'll be presenting here uh, is detailed in this article, uh, Simulation Testing Methods for Estimating Misreported Catch in a state based Stock Assessment Model uh, in ICES Journal in 2020. Uh, so if you want more details, you can take a look at that. Uh, and this is work that we've been kind of working on uh, more or less for two years. Um, basically, when I'm, when I'm not doing stock assessments, uh, I've been um, working on this, this topic. All right, so uh, presentation outline. Uh, I'll start out with just a bit of a background on catch and reporting. Uh, I'll talk about some previous attempts to address it uh, in stock assessment models and talk about its relevance to both our region and, and nationally. Uh, I'll then go into an overview of state-space stock assessment models. In particular, I'll talk about the SAM model, which is the one that we use in, in our study. Uh, and I'll describe how misreporting is estimated in that model. Uh, I'll then describe our simulation study, the project that I'll be presenting here and what its goals were. Uh, and then I'll show the effect of misreporting on some commonly used assessment outputs. And then I'll conclude with a discussion of, of ongoing work and future work. <clears throat> so uh, project background, uh, our motivation here was that uh, catch misreporting is sort of a well-known problem in the Northeast US uh, and globally. Uh, and then simultaneously, uh, we've experienced more and more uh, uh, state-space assessment models uh, coming out. Uh, they've been increasingly popular uh, state-space models in general on both fishery science and ecology. So we have this problem of catch misreporting and we have a potential solution in, in state-space models. <clears throat> Uh, the state-based stock assessment model SAM uh, is, is commonly used to assess IC stocks. So that was the, the model that we focused on for the study. Uh, but there's also uh, work in progress on a state-based assessment model at the Northeast Center. So uh, we have a lot of local interest in, in this topic. And like broadly speaking, we want to understand the strengths and weaknesses of state-based models. Uh, and then in particular, we want to know uh, whether they can help us uh, address this problem of misreported catch. 
So first off, what is catch misreporting? Uh, it's also known as illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, so IUU fishing. And um, <clears throat> there's lots of reasons for misreported catch. Uh, it can be mislabeled landed fish, so calling a fish something that it's not. Uh, inaccurate reporting of the location of fish, so that would be um, reporting the correct species, but perhaps the wrong stock. Uh, unreported discarding, so just not reporting it at all, and then unreported landings. So not all uh, of those examples uh, are intentional misreporting, um, but some of them are, and we've had a high profile case uh, in the Northeast recent, recently. So uh, the way this typically shows up uh, is as underreporting. So uh, landings would be higher than what's, what's reported, but uh, there is a possibility for overreporting if there's some mislabeling of landing fish. And the key thing for us here is that uh, direct estimation is difficult. So just the nature of uh, misreporting is that it's not observed easily. So uh, we, we need to estimate it uh, to infer it. So uh, we're not the first people to think about um, misreported catch and how to uh, account for it in stock assessment models. Uh, some, this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but uh, some examples of how it's been uh, addressed in the past was to exclude catch completely. Uh, another approach was to estimate it outside of the model. <clears throat> and the idea there is that uh, if you have some idea of the incentives for misreporting, you can um, try to estimate it outside of the model and then uh, include the adjusted catch inside the model. Uh, another approach is to treat catch as a censored observation. And the idea there is that the observed catch is a lower bound for the true catch. And that's been done in a, in a few different uh, applications, uh, but most recently in a state-space model also. Uh, and the approach that we'll uh, focus on here is uh, the approach used in the SAM model, which is to estimate an additional set of scale parameters, which allow us to scale the observed catch to the true catch. So uh, why use a state-space assessment model to address this problem? Some of its uh, strengths uh, make it sort of uniquely applicable here. The key thing is it's able to explicitly model hierarchical processes. So uh, something like population dynamics and surveys and harvesting. Uh, and then it can partition out uh, different uh, sources of error, observation error and process error. So it can differentiate between say recruitment variability and, and survey error. And then uh, it can model unobserved processes. And we know that misreported catch is typically an unobserved process. So um, observed catch being a mixture of true catch, error, and systematic bias uh, makes it uh, potentially a good candidate to be uh, addressed by a state-space assessment model. OK, so uh, the model that we um, used in our simulation study is called SAM, stands for State Space Assessment Model. Uh, it's an age and length based model developed by Anders Nielsen et al. Uh, I believe it's currently used to assess over 20 IC stocks, so uh, it's pretty popular uh, and uh, it has been suggested to be used in the Northeast, for example, so uh, we were interested in getting to know the model better. <clears throat> uh, it's written in Template Model Builder, uh, which is um, sort of what makes the State Space Assessment Models possible. Uh, they utilize the class approximation and they can estimate complicated latent variables, also known as random effects. Uh, what's a little bit unique about SAM is that it uses correlated random walks. Uh, it uses that to both model uh, log F and uh, you can use them to model recruitment as well. And then we also use them uh, in the study to model misreporting, which I'll, I'll get into in a second. So just to drive that point home, uh, here's the population model and fishing mortality model he used in SAM. And in the first line, uh, you can see that this, this is the recruitment equation. And so what it means to be a random walk is that uh, recruitment in year Y is equal to recruitment the year before plus some noise. Uh, so, so that's your random walk right there. And then similarly for log F is also a random walk and it's the same idea there. Uh, although uh, SAM allows for uh, correlation in the random walk, so it can be correlated across ages. 
and just a little bit more detail on what what that means because uh, we hadn't really worked with random walks before uh, in an assessment model so we spent some time trying to understand them uh, understand their strengths and weaknesses uh, so if we start with our equation uh, that we ended with in the previous slide and then we just take first differences of the log f in, in year y and year y minus one the idea is that those first differences are multivariate normal distributed so that's that's really what the random walk is um, it's it's basically just a flexible way of of estimating f in lots of different um, functional forms uh, and so you can impose different correlations on the random walk uh, the most flexible would be an independent random walk where uh, all of the f's can evolve independently of each other uh, and then you have a few other uh, options in sam uh, that uh, impose different correlation structures. Uh, that's correlation across ages. So that was uh, random walks in SAM. And then misreporting, and this is the thing that we spent a lot of time on. <clears throat> uh, this describes how misreporting uh, is estimated in SAM. And so uh, if we start with just our basic catch equation, uh, the way uh, SAM estimates misreporting is to add the scale parameter. Uh, and in sort of the base SAM model, uh, it's estimated as a fixed effect, which means that uh, the user uh, will have to specify the ages and the years to estimate it. So uh, it requires some expert knowledge, if you will, to know uh, how to do that, uh, what years and ages make sense, basically. <clears throat> and then here is an um, example simulation of the scale parameter set to two. And so what, Scale greater than one means that uh, there is underreporting going on. Uh, a scale parameter set to two uh, means that the true catch is twice the observed catch, uh, the deterministic true catch. Uh, so you can just see a plot of that here, uh, where the true is always higher than the observed, uh, and then there's there's some error. So uh, the var it varies a little bit the amount of difference, but uh, on average it's it's double. So that's that's how misreporting uh, in SAM sort of works like out of the box, if you will. Uh, and we wanted to sort of play around with it and see if we could make an improvement on that. Um, the main thing is we were looking for something a little bit more flexible uh, where you didn't have to set uh, the years and ages beforehand. <clears throat> so uh, we imposed, we went into the code and it's all open source, which is great. Uh, and we, we swapped around the code a little bit and put in random walk misreporting. So this is, Similar to um, similar to F and and recruitment, where now we're saying the first differences are normally distributed, uh, and that's just uh, kind of a flexible way of allowing the, the misreporting to uh, vary over time. And so on the bottom, you can see a plot of that, and uh, you can see the difference between the observed and the true catch uh, varies over time. Uh, it varies independently across ages. So we we imposed an independent random walk. It's sort of the most flexible version of this. Uh, and then in some cases, you, you can get a slight under uh, over reporting. So that's what we see here. So that's just an example of what uh, we tried that in this uh, study. <clears throat> so the simulation study design, uh, we chose uh, the operating model to be based on a SAM fit to North Sea COD. So that's uh, six age classes, two surveys, one fishery, 52 years of data. Uh, and then we imposed misreporting in the last 10 years. Uh, and we have four different ways that the misreporting occurs. <clears throat> so the first sort of base case is, is no misreporting, uh, sort of like the control. Uh, and then the next three are all different ways that misreporting occurs. So there's fixed misreporting which is uh, each simulation replicate, we randomly choose uh, an amount of, of misreporting, anywhere from 33 to 90% underreported. We have random walk misreporting, where it randomly walks, but on average, it was set to two thirds underreported. Uh, and then uniform random misreporting, where uh, the idea there was that neither of our um, estimation models match this last case. So this is, uh, this uniform random case is where all the models are misspecified. So those were our four simulation scenarios. And then we did sort of a cross-test 
uh, and a self-test with three uh, estimation models. So one was the, the base case, the no misreporting model, where you don't try to estimate misreporting. Uh, the second was a fixed model where all of the ages and years share one parameter to, for misreporting. So you're just estimating uh, one level of misreporting across years and ages. So it's kind of the simplest way of doing it. And then we compared that simple way to the most complicated way, which is uh, to impose an independent random walk uh, over time. So that's the random walk misreporting estimation model. So for each scenario, we did 300 replicates. We checked for model convergence. Uh, and then all models use the correct misreporting time period. So uh, misreporting occurred in the last 10 years, uh, and it was estimated in the last 10 years. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about lifting that assumption uh, at, the, at the end. And then we looked at different performance metrics, um, mostly based on mean either absolute percent error or mean percent error uh, of catch, F, abundance, and SSP. Uh, we also looked at retrospective error using Moan's row. And then we looked at catch advice accuracy using the F40% proxy. So those were our different performance metrics. Okay, so we have a couple of kind of side notes of things that we learned along the way that uh, we thought were interesting. Uh, so I, I figured I would mention them. So the first thing we learned was that simulating random walks can sometimes be tricky. And we run into this situation where occasionally the simulated population would just blow up. Uh, and uh, we weren't really sure why that was happening. Uh, for a while, we thought it was a bug. Um, but it turns out that this is just a property of simulating a random walk when it's not constrained to the observations. So a little bit more on that. Uh, the random walks in SAM are, are all on the log scale. And uh, a random walk on log scale is pretty well behaved. You can see that on the left. The expected value over time is constant. Uh, but when you exponentiate that, uh, because the error is strictly positive, uh, you get an increasing expected value over time. So, so this is what leads to these occasional blowups in the simulations. Uh, and the rate of increase depends on the process error. So it wasn't uh, a big problem in our simulations because the process error of North Sea cod was relatively low, um, but it could be a problem for simulating other species, um, particularly say like forage fish that you would think have higher, error, higher amounts of process error. So that was just something we learned. So now on to uh, our simulations. It just gives you uh, an example simulation to show you uh, what we are working with. Uh, this is uh, the case of no misreporting, a single simulation showing the observed and the true for abundance, the surveys, and catch. So you can see the amount of observation error there is. And then going from that to the scale parameter. Now, this is the parameter that uh, controls misreporting. So this was an important one uh, to look at. So uh, in the no misreporting scenario, which is the top row, uh, so we have ages are the columns, and then the rows are the scenarios. Uh, and then the x-axis is the year. So in no misreporting, the scale parameter is set to one, so there's no misreporting at all. Uh, in the fixed scenario, the second row, uh, the scale parameter varies, but in this case, it's seven. So it's the same for all ages and years. Uh, in the third row is the random walk misreporting. So that's misreporting just randomly walking across each age and year over time. Uh, and then the last one was the uniform random scenario. So this is kind of an extreme case where uh, the misreporting level jumps widely from year to year, uh, and the jumps are uncorrelated across ages. So those are our, our three scenarios graphically. And then here's an example of fitting each of those estimation models to uh, each of those examples. So uh, the big, the main takeaways here are that both of the methods uh, did reasonably well at estimating this reporting. Uh, you can see that in this example. Uh, but there were large differences in the confidence interval across the two methods. So the more flexible approach of the random walk uh, tended to have um, much larger confidence intervals uh, than the more rigid approach of the fixed, uh, the fixed estimation model. 
Um, so, uh, but what you, do, you can see is that the random walk uh, will kind of closely follow it, although we do get these occasional cases where it doesn't. Um, but even in the uniform random scenarios, that's, that's very different from a random walk, right? Because it's going up and down, uh, there's no correlation. Uh, we were surprised to see that actually the random walk did a pretty good job of uh, tracking those ups and downs. So it's a, it's a flexible way um, of estimating uh, these sort of latent processes. But uh, there was quite a bit of uncertainty, and you can see that here. Uh, the scale parameter is quite wide compared to the scale parameter for the fixed model. And so that uncertainty has sort of knock-on effects uh, that we'll see later on that affect the uh, estimation of the variables that we really care about. So um, next up is an example simulation of catch. So uh, what we have here is just one simulation from each scenario. Uh, and we have the true is the black line and the observed uh, is the dashed line. Uh, and then we have our two estimation models, um, uh, both the fixed and random walk uh, shown in the, in the two colors. And uh, the main takeaways here are that <clears throat> the, um, the estimation models both did a uh, pretty good job of tracking the true catch, uh, and even when it was pretty far away from the observed catch. So uh, we consider this pretty good performance. Um, but then we wanted to know what happens when you don't estimate misreporting. And there, there were some sort of ideas going into this that, you know, state-space models with their process error may be able to capture some model misspecification. So uh, maybe the base model would do a decent job of, of matching the true catch. Um, but what we found was uh, basically when you don't estimate misreporting, uh, the model matches the observed catch very closely. So uh, it just adjusts other parameters uh, behind the scenes uh, and it gets a close fit to the observed catch. So uh, of course this leads to uh, large errors and we'll see that next. So now we're looking at the mean percent error of all the simulation replicates over across all ages uh, for each of the scenarios. And we're just looking at the no misreporting models. This is the model when you don't estimate misreporting at all. And so on the top left, uh, you can see that, uh, so first off, the y-axis change depending on the scenario. So this is just a 2% error range. Uh, so basically the no misreporting model was unbiased uh, and did a good job when there was no misreporting. But as soon as we got to our other scenarios where the um, misreporting kicks in in the last 10 years, uh, we find that basically uh, the errors uh, are, are quite large. So in this case, uh, it's underestimating the true catch by roughly 70% on average towards the end of the time series. Uh, for the random walk scenario, it's about 50%, and uniform random, it was about 70%. So um, when you don't estimate misreporting, you get pretty large catch estimation errors. So then what happens when um, we do estimate misreporting? And we find that the main takeaway here is that both of the methods performed much better than uh, not estimating it at all. Um, they're pretty much unbiased, although you do see the random walk is, is kind of uh, getting some larger errors uh, when there's no misreporting, um, but uh, much better than not estimating misreporting at all. So that was just the, the error for catch. So now we're looking at the error for catch, F, N, and SSP across all the scenarios. So, and this is the mean absolute percent error. Now everything is, is uh, on a positive scale. So higher is, is worse here. Uh, so you can start to see uh, the main takeaways here are that uh, the errors that you saw in catch uh, show up in F, N, and SSP. So, when you don't estimate misreporting, for example, in a fixed scenario, uh, you get large errors in N, in F, uh, in N, and in SSP. Uh, they're much larger than what you find in either of the misreporting models. Uh, the same thing was true in the random walk scenario and uniform random scenario. And the other direct, the other. Um, thing that we noticed was that the direction of error is not always straightforward. 
So, uh, you know, we had some thoughts going into this that uh, you can maybe just do a mental experiment to figure out how misreporting would bias your results. Um, but here now we're looking at the mean percent error. So this is showing the bias in the estimates over time. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, looking at F in the random walk scenario, when you don't estimate misreporting, uh, at first you overestimate F uh, and then you underestimate it. Uh, and for example, in N in the fixed scenario, you're, you're overestimating N and then it drops and goes back up. And the random walk scenario is it's underestimating N throughout. So the, the main takeaway here was that um, to, to be a little bit cautious about how you think about how misreporting will affect your results, um, because it's probably going to depend on the shape of the misreporting and the, um, the structure of the estimation model. Okay, and so um, this is a more minor point, but the other thing that we found, uh, now we're looking at the estimation error of just the two misreporting models, uh, and this is the mean absolute error. Uh, what we found was that, generally speaking, the more simple fixed model outperformed the more complicated flexible random walk model. So you can see that uh, in this in a no misreporting scenario that the errors for the more flexible model were higher on average than the uh, more rigid fixed model, the simpler model. Um, in the random walk scenario, the, the random walk model is correctly specified, so it outperformed the fixed model, that sort of makes sense. Uh, but in the case where both models are misspecified, that's in the uniform random scenario, uh, we found that the, um, the simpler fixed model actually performs better than the more flexible random walk model. So, you know, in reality, we're always using a misspecified model. So we thought it was important to point out that uh, in the one scenario where both models were misspecified, uh, the simpler model did better. But these differences are, are relatively minor uh, compared to the large, um, the large amount of error that we saw when you don't estimate misreporting at all. So just to go into that a little bit further, uh, one of the interesting things that we found, and uh, now we're just looking at the scale estimation error, so that's the parameter that controls misreporting. Uh, and this is the error over time. And I just want to point out in the uniform random scenario where both models are misspecified, the random walk model actually estimates misreporting better than the fixed model. That's kind of counterintuitive because we just saw that the fixed model estimates the other variables better than the random walk model. Um, but we find that the random walk model estimates misreporting more accurately, but those estimates come with more uncertainty. So what we find is uh, in the uniform random scenario, now we're looking at the relationship between the estimation of that scale parameter, the estimation error of that scale parameter, and the error of the other variables that we actually care about. Um, so we have catch F and an SSB. Even though the random walk uh, estimated the scale parameter more accurately, it was less accurate at estimating uh, all of the other parameters, all the other variables of interest. So this is a little bit counterintuitive, um, but what we think is going on here uh, goes back to the figure that I showed early on, which is that the flexibility of the random walk model comes at a cost, and that's that there are these much larger uncertainties uh, associated with the estimates uh, and then those uncertainties get propagated through the model and lead to less accurate estimates of the variables that we actually care about. So, um, you know, it's sort of an avenue for more research, but there's this question that this brings up was, is that uh, if you include more complicated latent processes in your model, uh, are you, are, is that coming at a cost to estimating some of the variables that you're more interested in? So that could be misreporting uh, or some other thing that you want to estimate in your model. Um, maybe that it is not worth doing if it's sacrificing some accuracy of uh, other variables. So then uh, one more side note thing that we learned here was that um, AIC was not really a reliable model selection technique. 
uh, when we uh, did the uh, uniform random scenario. So when we looked at the uniform random scenario where all of the estimation models are misspecified. Uh, so that's the, the bottom row of this table here. This is showing the proportion of the replicates where each model was chosen as the quote unquote best model. Uh, what we found was the random walk model was always chosen as the best model by AIC, but uh, we just we just uh, looked at how the fixed model is actually the more accurate model. So AIC was not choosing the more accurate model there. Um, and that's sort of a well-known issue. Um, when you're comparing models with different random effect structures, uh, AIC can be misleading. Um, but uh, we were sort of reminded of that here uh, and thought we would um, highlight it. <clears throat> So on to retrospective error, uh, and this is something that uh, we spend a lot of time, at least in the Northeast, uh, trying to look at and, and, and solve. But retrospective error is the systematic bias that occurs when an assessment model is updated with additional data. And so in this cartoon, you can see that uh, each year that the model is updated, you have a downward adjustment in the uh, estimate of, of spawning stock biomass. So uh, these are types of things that we want to avoid. And then the question is, um, how, how is retrospective error depicted in each of our estimation models? So these are the results uh, of the retrospective error as uh, quantified by mean absolute moans row uh, for each estimation model in each scenario uh, across three variables. So uh, the big thing, to, to notice is uh, just that uh, in general, the no misreporting model had the largest retrospective errors. So this kind of goes along with our uh, estimation error uh, results. Um, but the other thing to notice is that these Mons rows are actually pretty low on average. Uh, there's a few cases where the range is relatively high, like here for no misreporting model. But in a lot of these other cases, uh, these Mons rows would be considered um, minor or not significant, really. Um, but we saw before that the no misreporting model had large estimation errors. So, um, you know, in some cases, we're seeing that um, retrospective error is not a great indicator of estimation error uh, for state space models. And that may be um, just a kind of artifact of this particular simulation scenario. Uh, or it may be a general property of state space models that um, we may want to look at uh, more closely. Uh, so the one other more minor point uh, here is that, uh, again, in the uniform random scenario, uh, the retrospective error of the random walk model is actually lower than the fixed model. But again, we showed that the fixed model had lower estimation errors. So um, this is suggesting that, again, the retrospective error is not really mapping to the estimation error the way we would hope. We would hope that the, the fixed retro would be lower than the random walk since it has more accurate estimates of the variables we care about, but that wasn't the case here. So a bit of a cautionary tale there. And then just to drive that point home, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that we do in the Northeast is called a retrospective adjustment. And basically, when uh, there's a strong retrospective pattern uh, over time, we'll adjust our terminal year estimates so that they sort of account for that error, that, that um, retro error. Uh, but what we found is that uh, with this set of state-space models, at least, uh, for the no misreporting model, which had very large estimation errors, there were actually very few runs that qualified for a retro adjustment. Uh, so uh, again, that's pointing to the fact that um, retrospective error may not be a great indicator of estimation error. Um, whether that's just in this simulation, again, or is a general property of state-based models is an open question, at least to us. And the last uh, set of results uh, is based on, uh, is looking at uh, catch and vice error. So in this case, we're looking at the FMSY error, 
And what we found was uh, across all of the misreporting scenarios, uh, FMSY was negatively biased. So uh, when you don't account for the misreporting, um, the FMSY that you get out of your estimation model is lower than the quote unquote true FMSY. Um, but when you do estimate it, you get, um, you get more or less unbiased estimates of FMSY. So uh, the two estimation models that estimate misreporting uh, did a good job, whereas when you ignore it, you're getting these, these biases. And take that one step further to the actual catch advice. Uh, the catch advice was also biased low in the no misreporting model. So when you ignore misreporting, uh, your catch advice is lower than what it should be. Um, but importantly, this doesn't include the unreported catch. So although the catch advice was biased roughly 20% in these simulations, the estimated catch was 50 to even 70% underestimated. So uh, I don't show that here, but you know, mentally you can think about there's an extra 50% of catch that's not being that's not being recorded by the model. So actually catch is greater than uh, MSY in these simulations, but the actual catch advice uh, is biased low. And then for the other two estimation models, it was more or less accurate. Uh, and this just shows the, the error on an absolute scale. So now uh, higher is better. Uh, and this is a, a similar pattern here. So um, you, know, you get, catch advice errors of up to 40% when you don't account for misreporting and that, that uh, amount goes down um, once you account for it. Uh, and then similar to our, our other results uh, in the uniform random scenario, uh, the fixed model provided more accurate catch advice than the slightly more complicated random walk model. So that difference is minor compared to this difference. Um, but again, it's showing that the simpler model is, is doing a bit better than the more flexible model. Okay, so um, some major conclusions or summing things up. Uh, generally speaking, um, not estimating misreporting when it's occurring leads to worse estimates than estimating it when it's not occurring. So there's sort of an asymmetric risk that we found uh, which is that the cost to not estimating misreporting can be very high, whereas if you estimate it and it's not occurring, uh, the, in theory at least, the model will tell you it's not occurring, so there's not a huge amount of risk. So there's sort of an asymmetry there. Uh, the choice of the misreporting model uh, was less important as long as it was estimating it, but generally speaking, the simpler fixed model outperformed the more complicated random walk model. Um, and that's because the increased flexibility of the random walk model comes at a cost. So that includes higher uncertainties and less accurate estimates of the variables that we actually care about, whether that's a property of all model, all state-based models with complicated latent processes, or just a result of this particular setup uh, is a bit of an open question. Uh, retrospective errors were generally low. Uh, and rarely required a retro adjustment despite large estimation errors. So, you know, typical rules of thumb that we use for retro, what, what a large retro is, um, may need to be adjusted if we move to state space acceptance models. And a couple of minor notes was that we found AIC was not really reliable when we were comparing models with different random effects when they're both misspecified, and that's of a known problem in the statistic literature, but um, we, we learned it here. Uh, and then simulating random walks can be tricky. It can lead to unrealistically high levels. And that's potentially a problem for management strategy evaluation and simulation testing in general. Um, but it could be fixed by swapping a random walk for an AR1 process. Um, so that may be a relatively easy fix to that problem. But uh, you know, in base SAM right now, you might find uh, that there are blow-ups when you simulate, and that's just something to know about. Uh, future research. Um, so we found here that uh, this is kind of research that we're, we're actively working on. The, the independent random walk was 
really too flexible, but the fixed effect single parameter is probably a little too rigid. So maybe a correlated random walk is just right. And that would mimic what's already done in SAM in, in log F. So uh, that may make sense as the best way of estimating uh, misreporting. Uh, we assumed here that misreporting time period is known uh, and that there was a relatively long period of accurately reported catch. And we're looking at now what happens when we lift that assumption. So that's important for uh, real data where we don't exactly know the misreporting time period. And then uh, finally, what happens when we apply this to real data? So um, how often is misreporting identified as a model uh, by the model as important? And then um, we may want to compare other um, model comparison techniques like cross-validation to AIC and retrospective error since we found that there were some issues with the latter. So that's kind of active research that we're doing. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. And i um, happy to take questions. And this is my contact info and my co-author's contact info. Excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation, Charles. Um, audience, we have about 19 minutes to answer your questions. So go ahead and look to the right and uh, you'll see a tab that says questions where you can enter your questions at this time. And I will read them to Charles so he can answer them. Uh, before I address this first question, um, if you're interested in Charles' slides, he's graciously shared them with us. So if you also look to the right, you can see there's a tab that says handouts and you can download his, his uh, slides for your own perusing. Uh, Charles, we do have a question. Uh, let me read this to you. It says, thanks for presenting some fantastic work. In the future, are you going to explore the influence of bias in the composition data used to inform the models and the form of the composition likelihood used? Bias in the composition data. Yeah, um, maybe. Um... One of the, uh, the nice things about the random walk model was that uh, it was able to track differences that varied across ages relatively well. So, um, you know, biases in the composition data, uh, so I'm thinking that means differences across ages, uh, in theory could be captured um, by, uh, say, a correlated random walk. Um, but, uh, we haven't looked at that specifically, um, uh, but it's it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm just encourage people to ask their questions while we have uh, Dr. Peretti here live. Um, I'll give it another minute because I know there is a delay in our question box. So, um, meanwhile, uh, Christian, did you have any last comments for Charles or the audience? Uh, I actually have a question for Charles. Um, so what what is the applicability of this work to models besides SAM? Yeah, I, well, I think that um, this sort of approach could be adapted to any state space model um, for sure. So uh, you know there is a, a state space model that's being actively developed at the Northeast Center. Uh, where some of these these ideas could be incorporated, um, but the idea of of estimating a, a fixed effect or, or a random walk um, to estimate misreporting, uh, in theory, could be included in any state space model that uh, allows for latent processes. So hopefully, it's it's broadly applicable to all state space assessment models. Great. We got another question in. Uh, the question asks, did you examine the effect of estimating underreporting on management advice if other aspects of the model are uh, misspecified, i.e. M? Um, so in the uniform random scenario, um, both of the models were misspecified uh, and we found that um, the catch advice was biased low, similar to the other ones. So that's, that's an example of of um, misspecification uh, and how it affects catch advice. Um, particularly the question of M um, is an interesting one. Uh, we did not look at that directly. Um, it, it may be possible to estimate 
both time bearing and, and misreporting um, under some constraints. I think you may have some confounding problems, uh, but we haven't, you know, it's just kind of talking off the cuff. Uh, we haven't specifically looked at that, um, uh, but it's a good question. Okay, we have another question. Uh, it says, thank you. I have a question about the large errors in catch and F. At the end of the time series relative to the beginning of the time series, there seem to be larger errors in estimates. Is this related to the age at recruitment or the number of ages that are being modeled? Why weren't there errors in the entire time series? Yeah, it's most likely due to the fact that the misreporting occurs in the last 10 years. So, um, you know, you're starting with a, a time series where uh, misreporting is quite, is, is low, it's zero, uh, until you get right to the end, and then we're seeing those very large errors. Um, so, uh, for example, in the, when you don't estimate misreporting, you see large errors at the end, uh, and that's primarily due to the fact of when misreporting is occurring. Okay, here's the, here's a little challenge here. Friendly fire here from Daroba. Do you think the better performance of the fixed misreporting approach would hold relative to the random walk if they were both misspecified using an OM that has misreporting that trends through um, time via a process that is not a random walk? Thanks, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't. I don't really know. Um, I would. I would tend to think that uh, if there was a trend through time, that that would be captured a little bit better by the random walk approach than by the fixed approach. Um, but it's a little bit hard to say without actually doing the work on it. But I do think that um, the approach of a correlated random walk may be kind of the best of both worlds, where you could both estimate uh, time varying um, uh, misreporting, but you'd also kind of share the parameters across the ages so that you would get something that's kind of a, a middle ground between the, the fixed approach and just the kind of independent random walks. So I think going forward, that probably makes the most sense. Nice job. <laughs> All right, here's another one. I assume that you are assuming that natural mortality was correctly specified. I just wonder what the model would do if M is misspecified. There may be confounding uh, between the underreporting catch and M. Yeah, yeah, it's, it kind of goes back to the other question. It has a similar uh, theme to it. So uh, we haven't looked at that directly. Um, and you know, again, like off the cuff, I think that if you put some constraints on M, uh, you you may be able to get something that is is reasonable, uh, you know, that converges. But uh, yeah, I can see that a potential issue um, with uh, it being confounded M and misreporting. But of course, that's a a problem for sort of all stock assessment models where we're assuming. You know, M is a, is a fixed value, so um, it's not really unique to to SAM in particular. Um, and there may be ways of of um, estimating some variability in M <clears throat> while still estimating misreporting. That's sort of future work. Great. Uh, a couple more questions have come in. Uh, this one says, "Thank you for the presentation. It was excellent." Would unobserved discards, for example, the observer effect, be captured by the scale parameter. Also, have any ISIS stocks used SAM to account for misreported catch? I don't know the answer to the second one. I'm, I'm not up on uh, the ISIS assessments, so I'm not sure if it's been used or not. Um, the first question uh, about discards and whether that would be captured by the scale parameter, um, the answer is yes. Um, if you, if it's a, a single fleet, you know, catch is, is catch. So, um, you know, it's being, it's being estimated as, as one sort of one set of numbers. So the misreporting would in theory be captured um, regardless of whether uh, the, the fish were dead because of discarding or dead because they were landing, landing. 
Um, this next qu question says, you mentioned applying this approach to real data in the future. Do you have any guesses about how this might differ when applied to real data instead of the simulated data, such as the use of AIC in retrospective analysis? Yeah. Um, so in real data, both all the models are misspecified um, and perhaps quite misspecified. Uh, so there's always the possibility that um, misreporting may be going on, but you know there are other processes that are also going on, and so the model is has a hard time differentiating between misreporting and other things. So I think one likely um, outcome is going to be that uh, we won't see such a large effect um, uh, due to a, a large difference between not estimating misreporting or estimating it. So I think that's a possibility. Um, and I'm sorry, I, 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 I forgot what the last part of that question was. Can you just repeat that? Or is it gone? Oh, it's, anyway, um, yeah, so, so that's my answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, all right, uh, one last question here. Um, it says, it looks like you allowed different trajectories of misreporting for each age group. If so, would you expect misreporting to be correlated across age groups, and how would would or could this simplify estimating misreporting? Yeah, so um, in the random walk scenario and in the uniform random scenario, uh, misreporting was was uncorrelated across ages, so that's that's correct. Um, but in the fixed scenario, it was perfectly correlated, uh, and um, in the no misreporting scenario, it was perfectly correlated. So, and we saw that the uh, the random walk model did a pretty good job, uh, not quite as good as the fixed model, but it did a, it did a good job um, estimating those cases where there was no variability uh, in misreporting at all. So, you know, there I think it, it's fine. Uh, I do think uh, allowing for some correlation across ages to be estimated uh, would be an improvement, um, but I, I, I don't foresee it being an issue to have um, uh, any any kind of correlation across ages in estimating this reporting. Great. Well, that appears to be our last question. Um, I'm going to give people an, another 30 seconds to enter a question if they'd like to ask Dr. Preddy anything today. But while I while we wait, I just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar was, was recorded. So we encourage you to share the link uh, with interested colleagues or watch the beginning of the presentation if you joined us late today. You can find the recording on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel or on the Library Seminars webpage. And I think that's the end of our session. I don't see any more questions. So uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you, you used uh, the library platform today to share your work and your slides. That was very generous of you. And um, I would like to uh, thank the audience as well for joining us for the Library Seminar and Kristen for introducing Charles. Uh, we're very proud here at the library to have NOAA work, uh, the com NOAA community and its partners present their work here, and I hope you will all join us again. So be well and have a good afternoon. <laughs>